Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our morning service here at 10th Street United Methodist Church. We are glad you're here this morning. Uh, hope everybody's surviving this <coughs> extremely hot weather. And uh, we're glad you're taking part of your Sunday to be with us. <coughs> Welcome to those of you uh, who are watching online. We're glad you're joining us. And um, I don't have any announcements that need to be made unless somebody knows of an upcoming event we should be aware of. So if not, uh, we will uh, begin our service with the call to worship if you would join me. Yeah, we, can, we can say everybody stand if you wish. Uh, we are here to touch the hem of grace. Let go of the heavy worry, the crippling of the Lord. To feel a surge of forgiveness, a rush of joy. To hear our name whispered and life affirmed. To sing praises in our own peace. And our opening hymn is number 130, God Will Take Care of You. Be not faithful ever be kind. God will take care of you. Be seated. 
as we come to our time of joys and concerns, uh, you'll notice that uh, we have added a, a name, sadly, to the prayer list. Uh, we want to remember the family of Wallace Johnson. Uh, Wallace passed away yesterday morning. Uh, Wallace, you will remember, is uh, Franklin's brother-in-law. Uh, the last brother-in-law Franklin had left, and uh, he was married to Franklin's, uh, Franklin's sister, Dorothy. And uh, it is the father of Carol and Jean Johnson, who uh, have visited our church from time to time. And, uh, Dorothy and uh, Wallace ran a, uh, uh, ran a uh, furniture store in New Brunswick for many years. And uh, then Carol and uh, Wallace ran it together after uh, Dorothy's passing. And so let's remember uh, Carol and Jean and Franklin and John and uh, Mary, Mary Lou and all the family in this time of uh, Wallace's passing and uh, funeral arrangements are pending. I will keep you all posted, but do be in prayer uh, for the family. Even when you've been expecting it a long time, you know, it's, it's always hard to lose a loved one and Wallace was 99 years old. He had just recently celebrated his 99th birthday. So what a long and full life he had. And he was uh, a veteran of World War II, uh, uh, fought in both the Normandy invasion on D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge, and had a marvelous full life as a community leader and a family man and, and a faithful United Methodist. So. Uh, we grieve with you all, John and Franklin, in the passing of Wallace. And uh, we want to continue to pray for much needed rain. This heat wave is just dragging on and on, and the drought is getting so much worse. And uh, we desperately need some cooler temperatures and rain. And uh, so uh, do be praying for that. We pray that this tropical storm that's forming in the Gulf that's supposed to come through and make landfall Tuesday or Wednesday might possibly give us some relief, but uh, just be lifting up this concern that we all have in your prayers. And uh, Don was sharing with me that uh, uh, Kenneth is uh, still very, very weak in the skilled nursing here in town at SP. And keep Kenneth and his family in your prayers. And uh, we want to be in prayer for Michael, who's on the way to uh, Virginia, visiting his brother for traveling mercies for him. And John, thank you for doing the uh, camera stuff for us today. And we also want to remember uh, Ed and Susan, who are uh, vacationing in Rio Dosa, New Mexico this week. And pray for traveling mercies for them. And Julie, it's good to have you back with us, and uh, glad you're with us today. And uh, are there, uh, we want to keep praying for you, Franklin, that you'll keep getting stronger. And uh, Frank, we want to uh, pray for you to continue to get stronger, and we want to thank you for uh, filling in as worship leader today. And uh, also, Don, we're praying for you that you'll keep getting stronger. And are there other prayer concerns or requests that you might have this morning? Julie? I have a praise first and then a request. But a praise, I've had a heart healthy test that I've had done before. Um, oh, good. And it um, came back good. So That's marvelous. But I'll still be having an annual visit in a few weeks with my cardiologist. Well, I just to keep monitoring, that. yeah. And then my request, because a good friend of mine I've noticed that What is her name? Anita. Anita. Okay, we will remember her. And are there others? Are there any birthdays or anniversaries in the coming week? Well, let's spend a moment in silent meditation and we can share with God whatever's on our hearts. 
and then I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer, and we'll join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you that we can be in your house today to worship you, to share with you our joys and concerns, to fellowship with one another and with you. May this time be a time when we are drawn closer to one another, closer to you. Uh, give us your grace, your strength, your wisdom and guidance uh, for the coming week. We pray for relief to this excessive heat that has plagued us for so long. We pray that we'd be blessed with rain and cooler temperatures, that we might get some relief from this tropical storm forming in the Gulf. Just give us relief that we desperately need. We ask that you would be with the family of Wallace Johnson, comfort them in the time of Wallace's passing. Uh, give uh, John and Franklin and all the family your grace, your comfort. Uh, guide them in the coming weeks. And uh, we thank you for the knowledge that we will see Wallace again one day. And for all the good memories that we share of him. We ask that you would be with uh, Julie's friend Anita as she begins chemotherapy work through the treatment she'll be receiving to bring healing to her and heal her leukemia and give her your comfort during this time. We thank you that Julie's uh, heart test came back positive and well and that she's doing okay. Help her to continue to stay well. We pray for your continued healing for uh, Jerry and Ellen Hoden and for uh, Don Franklin and for Frank. We ask that you would uh, grant traveling mercies to Michael and Ed and Susan and return them safely home. Be with Kenneth and uh, bring healing to him and help him to get stronger. Just surround him and all the family with your love and care. We thank you for your presence with us. We lift up to you all the other names in our prayer list and the names that are not spoken aloud or written down but are very real in our hearts. We offer them up to you, trusting you to be at work in these situations <coughs> as only you can. Bless us now in our worship and service to you. Help us to live each day as Jesus taught us to live when he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time we have a message for our young disciples. We're glad all of you are joining us today online with your parents. And if you've ever, uh, if your parents own a boat, or if some friends of your parents own a boat, <coughs> and you've ever been out on a lake or on a river in the boat with your parents, there's probably a certain type of vest <coughs> called a life preserver that they have wanted you to wear. And uh, it's a funny, puffy little vest. It's usually a bright color like yellow or orange. And it fits over your head and you have to secure it across your chest. And a life preserver is very important because if you should fall out of the boat, it keeps you afloat, it keeps you from sinking. And if you've ever gone on an ocean cruise with your parents on an ocean liner, 
Uh, they always uh, have you practice uh, drills with putting on a life vest and preparing to get in a life boat, boat because a life preserver or a life vest is very important when you're going to be traveling on water. They're very buoyant and even if you can swim pretty well, they still help you to stay afloat if the water is rough and choppy. So that's a very important thing to have on hand if you travel by water. And uh, Jesus is kind of like a life preserver too. Uh, Jesus is with us when the storms of life get rough. He's with us when the waters of life are choppy. Jesus helps us stay afloat. He preserves our lives. He preserves our spirits. He gives us hope. He gives us a reason for living. He's always there to help us uh, keep our heads above water, as it were. So the next time you uh, go on a boat ride with your parents and you have to put on one of those funny, puffy life preservers, think about Jesus. And think about how Jesus is the greatest life preserver of all. We're glad you're with us today. And now our next hymn is number 140, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou being presented, let's stand and sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Frank is going to read our scripture lesson for us. I'll, I'll 
scripture today is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 45, verses 1 to 15. Joseph makes himself known. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for sending me here, sending me here, because it was to serve, save others. God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there's been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant of earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me a father to Pharaoh and all of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it's really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all you, the honor accorded to me in Egypt and about everything you have seen, and bring my father down here quickly. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept, and Benjamin embraced him, weeping, and he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Those who have uh, been on a cruise ship on a journey across the ocean to somewhere will uh, tell you that, uh, and those of you who have traveled on a cruise ship know this, that there's an obligatory part of an ocean cruise that every passenger has to go through. Usually takes place on the first day of the trip. Uh, you, you divide up into groups and your group gathers at a designated place on the deck along with some other members of the crew. Uh, this is the obligatory lifeboat drill. And the other members of the, of the crew who are with you, they might normally work as waiters, as cooks, as stewards, uh, as clerks, whatever. But for the time being, they're sailors. And uh, the lifeboat is hanging ominously overhead. And the person in charge of the group uh, will explain to you that in the unlikely remote possibility that the ship should sink, that you are to report to this designated spot on the deck with all with the members of your group and the members of the crew who are designated to be here, it is their responsibility to help you get over the rail uh, into your uh, lifeboat and cast away. Real downer, real bummer. You know, here you are looking forward to getting away, to relaxing on an ocean cruise. First day of the trip, you're confronted with the possibility of, uh, 
you know, yeah, it's possible, you know, remotely, but possible that something could happen and the ship could sink because uh, unlike the makers of the Titanic said, no ship is unsinkable. But don't worry, if that should happen, which is way remotely impossible, you know, you know we, we would be prepared. And uh, as part, and you know, that, there's some nervous laughter, uh, a couple of bad Titanic jokes, and uh, you go through the drill, and uh, part of the drill is that you uh, put on these uh, life preservers, these puffy vests, and the uh, crew members show you how to cinch it snugly across your chest. And how, and how to make sure it's properly fit, fitting. And they explain to you that it has a, a, it has a flashlight and a whistle on it. And uh, then the uh, whistle sounds and the, the boat drill is over and everybody goes about their business. You try to push it out of your mind. Uh, but of course, there's that little nagging thing in the back of your mind that uh, you know, and the remote possibility the ship should sink or get into trouble. It's comforting to know that there's a life preserver with your name on it waiting at your designated station on deck. Now, there's another type of life preserver that's mentioned in the scripture that we looked at today, the scripture from Genesis. This life preserver is not a vest. This life preserver is a human being. He never got close to the deep briny ocean, as far as we know. But his name was Joseph. He was the, uh, he was the youngest of Jacob's 11 sons. And uh, Joseph has a most fascinating story in the last part of the book of Genesis. Uh, there are many Josephs mentioned in the Bible, but only two have really stuck in people's minds. The Joseph who is the earthly father of uh, Jesus in the New Testament, and this Joseph in the Old Testament. His story has inspired countless generations who have dealt with difficult times. Now, uh, Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. And every Sunday school student learns the story about Joseph's coat of many colors that his father Jacob made him to wear because jo Joseph was Jacob's favorite. And Jacob made no effort to conceal it. He openly showed his favoritism to Joseph, which made his other brothers very jealous of him. And uh, I never will forget that uh, I, uh, on a, on my, when I taught Old Testament survey at Baylor, on one of the tests I uh, asked, you know, uh, on a multiple choice question, well, it was a fill in the blank question, I asked, uh, who, in the, who in the scripture wore the coat of many colors? And most of the Students wrote right away, Joseph, but there was one poor young girl who wrote in Dolly Parton. And well, yeah, Dolly Parton wrote a great song about a coat of many colors. And uh, I gently reminded the girl when I gave her her you know, corrected test paper that, well, you don't get any points for it. You have good taste in music, but Joseph is the one who buy. And Dolly Parton based the song on <coughs> Joseph's story that inspired her to write it, her mother telling her that story when her mother made her the coat of many colors. Now, Joseph's brothers are so jealous of him and uh, that they finally can't stand it anymore. They, when he comes out to the field to check on him, tending the sheep, they beat him up. Things get out of hand quickly. They throw him in a pit and they sell him to some slave traders who are passing by on the way to Egypt. And to cover up their dastardly deed, they smear his coat of many colors with some sheep's blood, take it back to Jacob and tell Jacob a fanciful story about how Joseph was attacked by a lion and killed 
on his way to visit them in the sheepfold. Well, Jacob grieves, and uh, the brothers cry crocodile tears, and uh, they think that's that. Twenty years pass, and uh, a famine has hit the land. The people are starving. Jacob desperately needs grain for his flocks, for the members of his clan, and he sends his sons to Egypt which is prospering because of the fertile lands around the Nile River. And uh, he tells them, go to, go to Egypt, buy grain and bring it back to us. So they go to Egypt. Now unbeknownst to them, the prime minister of Egypt that they have to deal with to get the grain is none other than Joseph. Joseph has not only survived, he has thrived. If you read his whole story in the Bible, you see it through a, an amazing series of ups and downs in which Joseph suffers much but never loses his faith. He eventually comes out on top and goes from being a slave all the way to the right-hand uh, assistant to Pharaoh because of the ability God gives Joseph to interpret dreams. And uh, Joseph has been warned in a dream about this seven-year famine that's coming, and it's going to hit Egypt too. So he's been leading the Egyptians to build storehouses and store grain, so they'll be ready to survive the famine. Joseph recognizes his brothers, but they don't recognize him. In 20 years after all, and they have assumed he's probably dead by now. And so Joseph, all this time, has had the possibility of thinking about how he's going to get revenge on his brothers if he ever sees them again. Uh, he's had all this time to think about uh, how uh, he'll be even with them. But Joseph has changed during all this time. He's gained a greater appreciation of life. His faith in God has increased. And Joseph has come to see that life is more important than hatred. Choosing life is more important than hanging on to hatred. Hatred only eats away at our spirits. And uh, he wants to see if his brothers have changed in all this time too. So he falsely accuses his youngest, his brother, younger brother Benjamin, who's been born while Joseph was away in Egypt. He falsely accuses Benjamin of stealing a valuable cup from the palace and threatens to make Benjamin a slave and says, the rest of you can go home with the grain you've bought, but this one will stay to be my slave. And Joseph wants to see if his brothers have changed or if they will still betray another brother. And Judah steps forward and says, no, no, Benjamin's our father's favorite. It would break his heart. He broke his heart when he lost Joseph. And take me instead, I'll stay and be a slave and let Benjamin go. And the other brothers all uh, say the same. And Joseph realizes that the years have changed his brothers as well. So he sends all of his courtiers out of the palace and he tells them who he is. They're terrified at first, uh-oh. Hey, hey, bro, we really didn't mean it, you know. We were just playing around. Sorry about that. But Joseph says, don't blame yourselves. It wasn't you who sent me here. It was God. Seven years of famine are coming. I want you to bring your, my father, your father, and all our tribe here to uh, Egypt so you can survive the famine. I'll settle you in the land of Goshen. We'll all be together. We'll survive the famine. And he tells his brothers those marvelous words, some of the most marvelous words in Scripture. 
God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph has chosen life over hatred. And he made all the difference in the world in the history of the people of Israel, in the history of the human race. Jesus wants us to always choose life over hatred. Because hatred is a cancer that eats away at our soul. There's an old Indian legend that tells about a young Indian boy who came to see his grandfather. He was very upset and angry because one of his playmates had cheated on him in the game. And he was very angry and upset. And he came to his father and says, how can I get even with him? And his wise old grandfather said, Grandson, listen to me. I want to tell you a story. He said, I too have struggled with people who have done bad things and have felt no remorse over it. And he said, but I have learned that there are two wolves inside each of our hearts. One wolf is a good wolf and seeks to live in harmony with all creation. He only fights when it is absolutely necessary, and then he fights in the right way. But the other wolf is evil. He's angry all the time. He's mad at the whole world. He attacks everything and everyone he sees. Uh, he's always angry, always hungry, always seeking for a revenge. And these two wolves that each of us have in our hearts are constantly battling for dominance over our hearts. And by this time, the young Indian boy's eyes had grown wide. And he says, which wolf wins, grandfather? And his grandfather smiles and says, the wolf we decide to feed. Joseph had struggled with those two wolves in his heart for 20 years. And he decided to feed the wolf of goodness, the wolf of love, rather than the wolf of hatred. God calls us to not let hatred gain a foothold in our souls, for it can eat away at us like a cancer. He calls on us to always choose the way of love. On January 9th, 1984, a famous picture appeared on the cover of Time magazine. The picture was of two men shaking hands. The two men could not be more different. One was in prison. One was a free man. One was a young. One was old. One was a Muslim. The other was a Christian. One man had tried to kill the other. One of the men was a condemned prisoner. The other man was a beloved world leader. One man wore the drab guard of a prisoner. The other man wore a resplendent white robe. The two men were Pope John Paul II and Mehmet Ali Agha. Mehmet Agha, a few weeks before, had tried to kill Pope John Paul II. And now John Paul had come to visit Mehmet Ali Agha in prison. It was quite a contrast, these two men in a stark white prison cell, the Pope and the man who had tried to assassinate him. Pope John Paul now held tenderly the hand that had held the pistol that had tried to kill him. The two men talked quietly for 20 minutes. Pope John Paul forgave Agha for the attempted assassination. He blessed him. The two men talked quietly and they, they shared a laugh or two. And then uh, Agha took Pope John Paul's hand and pressed it to his forehead 
a Muslim gesture of respect. The caption below the picture read, Does forgiveness have a place in this age of violence and vengeance and hatred? Yes, it does, Jesus would tell us. Yes, it does. Yes, it does, Joseph said. Yes, it does. Now notice that Agaga is still in prison. He still must pay the penalty for his crimes. Just because we let go of hatred, just because we may forgive somebody, doesn't mean we condone what they did. It doesn't mean we forget. It doesn't mean we suddenly like them a lot and become buddy-buddy with them. It just means we let them stop controlling our lives. We let hatred, we stop hatred from dominating our hearts. We let go of that hatred. We give our hatred in that person to God and leave it there and walk away. It just means that we choose freedom and life over hatred and vengeance. For those two things will ultimately eat away at ourselves and we're only hurting ourselves in the long run, not the person who did the wrong. Um, deep, deep, uh, the great Methodist pastor D.L. Dykes told the story of how when he was a little boy, in elementary school, there was a bully that pestered him endlessly. And D.L. Dykes found a sharp grass fur on the school lawn. And he decided that he was going to get even with that bully. He was going to sneak up behind him and drop that grass fur down the bully's shirt collar so that he would scratch him up. That is serving right. So he stuck the grass fur in his pants pocket to wait for an opportune moment to do that. But every time he would get close enough to the bully to do it, either the bully would turn around and D.L. would lose his courage and walk away, or if the teacher would come in the room or out of the playground, he couldn't do it then. Again and again, he failed to get the grass fur down the bully's shirt collar. But he kept it in his pants pocket so long that he wore a hole in his pants pocket and the thorn scraped his own thigh mercilessly and it got infected. And he had to go to the doctor and get a penicillin shot and treatments. Hatred is a festering sore. Vengeance is ultimately a sour feeling in the stomach. In uh, Larry McMurtry's novel, Terms of Endearment, there's a scene where uh, uh, Tommy, a young boy, is struggling to say goodbye to his mother, Emma, who is dying. And Emma wraps her arms around Tommy. Tommy kind of hugs her awkwardly. They've often had arguments. They haven't always got along. And Emma says, Tommy, be sweet. Stop pretending that you don't like me. Uh, one, of, one of these days, you're going to remember that I read you a lot of stories, that I made you a lot of milkshakes, that even though I aggravated you a lot, that we have some good times, too, to remember. And uh, I'm not going to be here much longer to help you remember that. In a year or two, when I'm no longer here, you're going to start remembering those things. And you're going to wish you could tell me that you love me, but I won't be here for you to tell me that. So I'm telling you now, Tommy, I know that you love me. I know that you love me, and I love you. And I want you to remember that. And I don't want you to feel guilty. I want you to let go of that guilt. And I want you to remember the good times we had. Now who's the strong person in that scene? It's not the young boy trying to act tough and macho. It's his dying mother 
who's trying to reach out to her stubborn little boy and help him to be free from the guilt she knows knows is coming. Uh, Dean Raimondo de Ovis, who uh, was for many years the pastor of St. Philip's Episcopal Church in Atlanta, loved to tell a story about when he was a little boy growing up in England, how uh, the boys would enjoy when they got out of school taking a shortcut through the cemetery so they could get home earlier. And one day, uh, the Ovis had had to stay late after school for soccer practice. And by the time they got through with soccer practice, it was already getting dark. So he had to cut through the cemetery at dark on his way home. And he couldn't see too well, and he fell into a freshly dug grave that had been dug for a funeral to be held the next morning. He tried and tried to get out of the grave, but it was too deep. He just couldn't make it to the top. He cried and cried for help, but it was after dark and no one was around. So he just decided to sit down in the corner of the grave and wait for the funeral director to arrive in the morning and get him out. Or he thought maybe his parents would come looking for him. After a while, he heard some whistling. He recognized the whistle. It was his friend Charlie who had also had to stay late for soccer practice and was also taking a shortcut through the cemetery. Dovey started to cry out to Charlie for help, and then he felt kind of mischievous, and he decided to just stay quiet and see what would happen. Sure enough, Charlie fell into the same grave. Charlie jumped up and down and screamed for help, clawed at the side of the grave and couldn't get out. And then Dean Dovey said in his most creepy, deepest voice he could muster, kind of a Boris Karloff voice. You can jump and scream all you want to, Charlie, but you'll never get out of here. <laughs> but Charlie did. In one flying leap, he was out of that grave, running across the cemetery for home, lickety-split. Now, if we can be that motivated by fear, by hatred, can't we also be that motivated by love? Let's reach out to Jesus. And let's help Jesus, let Jesus help us to always choose life over hatred and fear. Praise be to God. Amen. Our closing hymn is uh, number 593, Here I Am, Lord. Let's all stand together and sing 593. Do you know that, Franklin? I don't know it. Okay. Let's, we'll do our best. Let's just do one verse. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry. All is well in dark and sin. My hand will say, I will make the stars of night. I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my life to him? Who shall I sing?